Cool. All right, everybody. Nice to meet y'all. I'm Manny. I'm one of the chiefs I'm currently at the university. I will be going on paternity leave right after this lecture. So there's that. Good for you, man. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so today we're going to talk about electrolytes. Maybe it's not as exciting for some of us as like respiratory failure or like a, a massive GI bleed. But I will tell you, uh, you will admit patients with a sodium of 95 and not knowing what to do can be pretty scary at that point. So really appreciate you guys being here to kind of walk through this. So quick things that we're going to touch on today. Um, I would like you all to be able to walk out of here with a good simplified approach to hyponatremia. I'd like you guys to kind of understand the difference between water disorders and sodium disorders. And then we'll spend some time on how we treat life or any hyperkalemia and round things out with a little bit of a uh, little conversation on hyperglycemia. So these are very common. I'm sure at this point, you've already been dealing with a lot of electrolyte disorders um, these last few days. So we dedicated kind of a whole lecture to this. All right, everybody knows the basic BMP skeleton. I'm not sure why I put this slide in here, but that's okay. Welcome everyone that's joining us. So what I wanna do is spend a little bit of time kind of um, being intentional about how we talk about volume disorders. Because this can get kind of confusing. We'll say things like that patient's a little volume up, that patient's a little hypovolemic, that patient's a little dehydrated. And we should really know what we mean when we say that. So can I have someone tell me, when we look at the compartments of the body, you've got the intracellular space, the extracellular space is distributed into the interstitial and plasma. Does sodium, the cation sodium, live in the intracellular space or the extracellular space? Extracellular space, nice. Points for you. Perfect. So the primary cation that lives in the intracellular space is the passive, but sodium lives out here. So let's say that for whatever reason, you have a patient who builds up sodium excess. Again, for whatever reason, it's mostly going to be in this extracellular space, right? As a solute builds up in a compartment, what happens to preserve the concentration? What has to rush in? Water. Agua. You got it. Perfect. So you all can see that if you have an excess of sodium in this space, you will expand your extracellular fluid compartment. Everybody with me on that? Cool. So can anyone tell me what that would look like on an exam when you go to the patient's bedside? Swelling. Swelling, right? Edema. Any other one we can think of? Elevated JVP and pulmonary crackles, right? Yep. So anything that's going to push fluid into the intercession, you'll be able to notice it on the exam. And you'll be able to make a comment on that patient's total salt, right? Are you making a comment on that patient's total water at that point? The answer is no, right? We use the exam to define whether a patient has excess sodium or not. What if, what would the patient tell us if the patient was salt down? So if all of a sudden this space contracted because there was very little sodium, if this space got really tiny, what might the patient tell you on history? It's a little old lady. She likes to stand up and sit down a lot. Very lightheaded. Lightheaded, right? Because if you shrink the extracellular fluid compartment, do you see how the plasma compartment will shrink too? So every time she goes to stand up, she's dizzy. She might even be hypotensive. So patient whose total salt down will present with orthostasis and hypertension. A patient whose total salt up will present with crackles, elevated JVP, lower extremity edema. Do you feel solid on that? Mm -hmm. Cool. So the exam is pretty straightforward and it tells you what's going on with sodium. The exam tells you nothing about what's going on with the total body water, okay? Luckily, you just look at some of the labs, okay? Can someone tell me in a hyponatremic patient, do we have excess or deficient water? Excess water. In a hypernatremic patient, we have excess or deficient water? Deficient. So let's take a second to spend a little time there. Because you're all frustrated with me that we decided to talk about water when I say hyponatremia and hypernatremia. You're like, dude, natremia is salt. I know that. But you're telling me it has to do with water. So we use salt on the BMP as a surrogate to understand what's going on with the patient's total body water. I want to summarize it one last time. The exam will comment to you about the patient's total salt status. The labs will comment to you about the patient's water status. We feel good? Cool. So you got some worksheets ahead of you here. I'm going to have you take five minutes with your partner, and I want you to put those four patients in the appropriate quadrant based on what you see here on the board. Take some time.
So where'd you put this patient? You made eye, it's tough, right? You made eye contact and then you look behind you like, I hope there's somebody else back there, right? It's just you. Sorry, right. what do you got? Bottom right. Bottom right. Okay, talk me through it. So um, the patient has decomposed or heart failure, so we'll see um, pulmonary edema, pulmonary edema, and then has just been diuresed, and we know the sodium level, so that's where the number goes by. Perfect. It, it, understanding the mechanism here it doesn't really matter. We'll chat about it, but you, again, correctly, you looked at the exam, you had evidence of excess sodium, you looked at the lab, you, you knew there was deficiency of water. Now, the reason for that is, Patients, when we give them large amounts of Lasix, they'll preferentially lose water over sodium. We, we give Lasix to get rid of sodium, but they actually preferentially will lose water at times, and that can reflect as a hypernatrium tool. So good job on that one. That was the hardest one. So number four, just a reminder, what was that one? Adult male with diarrhea, eating himself by consuming lots of water, not getting it. All right. So diarrhea, drinking water, just water by itself. Can, obviously, we're going to talk left, but can anyone talk me through why? Well, you're losing both salt and water to diarrhea and only drinking free water or free ish water. So, um, perfect. And so, again, you don't see any sodium excess on his exam. You look at his labs, and it's obvious that he's got excess water, right? Cool. How do we feel on that? This is big, you guys. If you feel good about this, you're like way ahead of where most interns are. You'll see patients in the ICU that get Lasix and they get D5. And most people are like, that makes no sense. But you all now understand you treat the salt problem, you treat the water problem. They're two different problems. You feel good about that? Cool. All right. We're going to keep posting along here. So our, our patient's a 65-year-old with a history of diabetes and hypertension. He's a bit too for cellulitis. But you notice the sodium of 121. So it's what day four right now? Your senior says, work it up. And so you guys are going to work this up. Any thoughts on what you would be ordering to work up this type of treatment? Nice. Urine lights. What do you mean by urine lights? What do you want to get? Urine sodium, urine osmolality. Perfect. That's awesome, Benjamin. That's it. I think if you start there, you're good to go, all right? And so we're going to spend a little bit of time going over the approach to um, going over this approach to hyponatremia. Yes. All right. So the way that this is usually taught, it uses the volume exam initially to kind of make your decision. But what we're going to do is we're going to use three tests and a physical exam at the end, and we're going to diagnose all the hyponatremia. There's a lot of nuance to this. It's sometimes not this straightforward, but we need to have an approach, at least initially, okay? So the first test, Benjamin went ahead and told me it was a serum osm. Why do you want to check that, Benjamin? What, what, what are you thinking there? Um, you want to make sure that it's a true hyponatremia, not, not something weird. Perfect. Yeah, that's exactly right. So if you guys remember, osmolality is basically the concentration of solute in your blood, right? And so the main contributor of osmolality is sodium. So if your sodium level is low, you would expect your osmolality to be low. Okay, perfect. Cool. So that's exactly right. You want to check a serum osmolality. You want to confirm that it's low. If it's not low, then you need to think why. So the main time that you'll see a serum osmolality that's high in our patient population is going to be in hyperglycemia. Anybody have any thoughts of why that happens? So we know there's excess glucose in the blood, and somehow we're being told the patient's hyponatremic. Their serum osmolality is actually super high. Can anyone reconcile that? Let's take a 90 second. You can Google it, do your thing, and let's come back and figure out why, why we see that, because we're going to see that pretty often here in our patients. So take a second. Yeah. Oh, like our, 
121, was that the serum sodium that you gave us for this case? Mm -hmm. okay. All right, guys, so let's let's circle back here. So any thoughts why sometimes we see a hyperosmolar hyponatremia? As evidenced by an elevated serum osm. I, I heard you guys saying it, but I get it. It's like, uh, I don't want to be the one to have to say it all that. Anybody braving it up? Okay, my thought was that glucose is trying to water in. It's in a uh, relatively decreasing concentration of sodium, but it would still be the same thing. Cool. So, so you're saying there's excess glucose in the blood. Water is going to be drawn out from the intracellular compartment out to the to the space where the sodium is, and so it's going to dilute the sodium, right? right? It is it is a true hyponatremia because the concentration of sodium is lower because you increase that water in that space. But as you correct the hyperglycemia, the water will return to its original compartment, and your sodium should go back to where it was. Does that all make sense? How do we correct for that when we're admitting a patient with DKA? They're coming in with a blood glucose of seven hundred. And their serum sodium is 120. How would we correct? Kind of understand where things are going to go once once you give them some insulin and fluids. Insulin and normal training. Okay, so you have to correct this serum sodium for how elevated this blood glucose is. And there's a way of doing that. Does anybody know? Yeah, so for every 100 over 100 blood glucose, add 2 to the serum sodium. It used to be 1.6, there's been some studies that said 2.4, make it easy on yourself, just 2. Cool? So in this patient, we've got 600 above 100, so 6 times 12 is 1. 6 times 12 is... Six times two. Yeah. Six times two. You guys are so scared to do math in front of people. <laughs> yeah. Like it's horrifying. So, all right, let's do this again. Sorry. So, um, two for two for every hundred over. We're twelve plus one twenty equals one thirty-two. Did everyone follow that? Okay. I feel like I lost half of you and half of you were there. So, for every hundred over hundred of your blood glucose, you add two. To the serum sodium, that's what you expect it to be once you correct for the hyperglycemia. Cool? Awesome. So that's that's the most often time that we'll see an elevated serum osm. We'll sometimes see a normal serum osm. Anybody have any idea about that and why that happens? I like it. I see a lot of squinting, which tells me that you're really thinking about it, but I'm just having trouble recalling. So this is actually what we call uh, a patient with pseudo hyponatremia. So this is a lab artifact. And the issue is if the patient has excess lipids or fats, the machine will read that as water and think that there's more water than there actually is and will dilute your sodium. We don't see this that often. But the important thing is if you ever see a serum osm that's normal in a patient with hyponatremia, don't believe it, but also think about things like hyperlipidemia or paraproteinemias like multiple myeloma. Cool? All right. We've spent enough time on those things. Most of the time, we're going to be dealing with a hypoosmolar hyponatremia with a low serum osmolar. So then where do we go here? So let me break, ask you guys this. Antidiuretic hormone, do you expect that to be increased or decreased in a patient with excess water? Decrease, right? It'd make no sense to ramp up antidiuretic hormone and hold on to water if you already have excess water. So we would expect antidiuretic hormone to be low in hyponatremia patients, right? We'll talk in a second why often we don't, but if your antidiuretic hormone is off, you should be getting rid of water, right? This problem shouldn't happen, but it does happen sometimes, and it's only in two circumstances. It's going to be in patients who drink so much water that they can't pee it out enough, or patients who have such a little solute that they have no solute to pull water out in their kidneys to, to urinate. Cool? Luckily for us, luckily for us, there's a test that's a surrogate for for antidiuretic hormone, and that's a urine osm. There isn't anything to think about concentrating urine, diluting urine. I just want you to remember if urine osm is high, antidiuretic hormone is high. It's straightforward, right? If antidiuretic hormone is low, urine osm is low. 
Cool. And the, can you remind me the only two times that you see hyponatremia with a low urinalism, low antidiuretic hormone? Drink too much or not enough salt. Not enough salt. Perfect. Cool. We feel good about that one? That one's straightforward. So let me ask you guys this. You all told me, hey, so I expect ADH to be down in a water excess state. Is there any reason that ADH would be ramped up in a water excess state? SIADH. Perfect. So in an inappropriate, it's just inappropriately on for whatever reason. Good. Can we think of any other reason? What's that? Awesome, Benjamin. Perfect. So you, you nailed it. So this all centers on two very um, nervous organs that sit back here. The kidneys are looking out. At any moment that they think that volume is going down, they're going to ramp up a mechanism to hold on to fluid to increase perfusion to the kidney. So if the kidney senses low perfusion, it'll activate the RAS system, which ultimately will activate antidiuretic hormone. So you guys told me there shouldn't be elevated antidiuretic hormone unless the kidney's freaking out and there's a stimulus for the increase in antidiuretic hormone. Feel good about that? Cool. So you told me that antidiuretic hormone, the surrogate for that was urinosome. The surrogate for renal perfusion is the urine sodium. So if you have a low urine sodium, nailed it. That's the reason that the kidney's freaking out and it's turning on all these compensatory mechanisms because it's sensing low perfusion. How do we feel on that? Everybody, everyone's buying it? Okay, I love it. All right. I'm getting the most eager head nods from med students and that's okay. <laughs> you all are like, dude, I have so much work to do and you wanna keep talking about this, but I've got you for the hour. Okay, so circumstances where you're gonna have low perfusion to the kidney. It's gonna be poor flow states like CHF. If you have cirrhosis, you will have decreased SVR, so your kidney's not really seeing a lot of blood. And then if you have hypovolemia, you have nephrosis, those are all circumstances where your kidneys are not gonna see enough perfusion. It's gonna ramp up all these mechanisms, it's gonna ramp up antidiuretic hormone, you're gonna develop hypertrophy. You can also see it in a patient who is hypovolemic, right? Little old lady. Someone forgot about her for 15 days, hasn't had any water to drink. Her kidneys are like, hey, I'm not getting any perfusion. And it's not that she has heart failure, it's just she's falling down. Cool? Can you all distinguish the difference between a heart failure patient and a little old lady who's falling down? I think so. I don't think that you or I or anyone can do a good job of distinguishing euvolemia from hypovolemia, but I think at the extremes we can distinguish them, right? So what's nice about this is if you get to number three and you have a low urine sodium, you do an exam. If they're hypervolemic, it's one of those top three causes, CHF, cirrhosis, or nephrosis. And if they're not hypervolemic, then you have to think it's likely hypovolemic. How are we doing? Cool? All right. So last thing, if the urine sodium is greater than 20, is there a stimulus to turn on antidiuretic hormone? Oh, you're not yes. What are you thinking? Uh, so that's a surrogate for renal perfusion. So it's saying, yeah, crank up ADH, we don't have enough blood, so keep the water in. So if the urine sodium is high, we have good renal perfusion. If the urine uh, sodium is low, we've got bad renal perfusion. Yeah, that's the key, high. right? So, but based on that, Kyle, if I tell you if your urine sodium is high, meaning that you've got good renal perfusion, is there a stimulus to turn on antidiuretic hormone? No. There's not an appropriate stimulus, but there might be an inappropriate stimulus. We're with us? And that's where we think of SIDH. You feel good about that? So we went through all this, and you don't think about SIDH until you see an elevated urine sodium. Because you think, the kidney's not freaking out. Why is antidiuretic going on? You feel good? Cool. At that point, you should also check for endocrinopathies like uh, hypothyroidism and adrenal insufficiency. Uh, but it's never that. Make sure the patient isn't on a thiazide because that could artificially increase your urine sodium. You all are experts. Let's run through four problems. You're going to have five minutes with your partner to get through them. And they use these uh, these principles we just went over. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So, uh, uh, so uh, 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 Oh, oh yeah, she's right. You're inserting this low. So we're not refusing. No peripheral edema, the same as no crack or muscle. I'm not seeing you. Or the Oh, this is probably yeah. 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 So you guys you guys are on it. Yeah. 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 This is the best, like the other three should have some component of your volume. On the process of what I'm seeing. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Or the box next to the the urine is 102. But I think, regardless, the kidneys are still sensitive to the flow. Yeah. I would say it's not primary volume. So I would say it's one of the things. I guess it's pretty good. Yeah. Maybe. I feel like we're still there. Uh, the first one's still, I don't know. Maybe this one's. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't just want to like put the same amount of crowd. Well, crack was on my mind. So I think cirrhosis can happen. Okay, are we taking the last one? Are we taking the last one? Like, it doesn't say no crack was here. That's why I'm thinking, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that would have purple Oh, wait, look at the next one. Yeah, I feel like it's not saying crack. It's a crack. Okay. <laughs> this might be a poor song. Maybe, because I know it's equivocal on the uh, urine of hospitals. But we don't have a compelling volume exam that would suggest hypovolemia or cyanogenic cirrhosis. I mean, maybe hypovolemia again. But you know, it's not the high iron and sodium. It could be the All right, salt. we're going to so yeah. wrap it up just because we're short on time. And I love, I, I love <laughs> the effort here. Can someone tell me the first patient's numbers? So, what was the serum awesome? 258. Okay. 450. 14. All right. Can someone talk me through? Oh, or in the exam? Uh, no peripheral edema or distended neck veins, no crackles on auscultation. Awesome. So can someone talk me through what they think is going on here? Back table, you guys want to take it? So their serum osms are low. Perfect. So they've got some sort of hypomethemia. So they've got hypoosmolar hypotremia, right? Cool. And their urine osms are very high, which means their ADH is high. Nice. And so we find out why their ADH is high by looking at the urine sodium. Uh, we find out that they're some orbital confusion. Perfect. Uh, and with the exam, their volume down on the exam, and so they're probably just hypovolemic. 
Nice. Hey, man, that was really great. I really did that. that was awesome. Who, anybody not follow that? And totally be honest, it's okay. If you, if you guys get this now, it will serve you well for the next three years. Everybody feel good with the way that you ran through that one? Cool. Can someone re read for me number three? Sierra Muslims are 258s. Okay. Urine Muslims are 102. Okay. Urine sodium is 12. No peripheral DM and no descending All right. You want to talk me through it, Kyle? Sure. So we've got uh, low serum osmolarity, so it's a true hypoosmolar hyponatremia. Awesome. What we got stuck is the urine osms are very equivocal. Um, so we know there's, there's no peripheral demon, no distended neck veins. So I'm thinking, okay, we're trying to decide where we're branching here. If we say 102 is technically over, that moves us to this little box. And that's telling us, is it CHFs for us in the first hypovolemia? It's not, physical exam is not consistent with the first three. So it could be hypovolemia. I think it might also be the poor solute. You're like, well, 102 is, is kind of low. They're not excreting that much sodium. They might not have that much sodium. That's awesome. So that's like a, that's a second year level conversation you just had. That was great. It never is going to be like straightforward, right? There's always going to be, could be this, could be that. I think you're picking up on a good point, which is, Honestly, like, yeah, it's a little bit higher than 100, but it's, that's a really low urine awesome. And if this patient was high bulbolemic, we would expect the compensatory mechanisms to kick in and antidiuretic hormones to not be as low as it is. So you, you're concerned about, like, poor solid intake here, right? So I'm with you. I think in this patient, if I was uh, admitting this patient, I would consider this patient to have ADH turned off. And I would think about either poor solute or um, polydip to the history point. Cool. Everybody follow that? We use these numbers, but these numbers are for you to remember something, but it doesn't mean that everything ends if it goes 101 instead of 100. Cool? Sweet. Um, I'm not saying why it's number two, not number three. You give me number two? Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. Let's do number four. <laughs> Oops, sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. I don't want to know. What do we have? The serum awesome here is? 258. 258. You're an awesome, 380. Urine sodium 45. In the exam? Trace lower extremity edema, worse around cellulitis, no crackles, can't see the GVD. All right. You want to talk us through this one? So we didn't get a chance to talk about this for oh, sure. No, perfect. <laughs> Let's do um, it together. Okay. All so right. our serum osmolality is low, so we know this is a true hyponatremia. 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 Our urine osms are high, so we know that you uh, that ADH is working. Nice. Um, and then our urine sodium is high, um, so it's an inappropriate response. Oh, I'm sorry. So yeah. You're 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 doing such a good job that I'm like uh, befuddled here. So really quick, <laughs> the urine sodium being high tells us that there's good or bad renal perfusion. Oh, I'm sorry, bad. Um, good renal perfusion. Nice. Yes. And so now tell me what you just told me. About um, the inappropriateness of this. Yeah. Okay. So it is. It is inappropriate. Um, potentially. SIADH, but. I guess we should check some other things. Awesome. So. That was again high level stuff. What you're doing here. You you reasoned your way. You said antidiuretic hormone is on. So I expect there to be a stimulus for antidiuretic hormone, and that stimulus should be that the kidney's not seeing blood. You check that, and the kidney's seeing plenty of blood. So you're thinking there's something fishy going on here, right? And this is the moment where you should think about SIDH. You should send off some endocrinopathy labs and do the whole thing, but you have to think about SIDH here. Cool? Quick weasel pivot point thing for you to remember. In real life, you might have an attending that says, give him 250 of water, let's see what happens. And that's okay, but you know that this approach tells you that you at least have to be worried that SIDH might be playing a role here. Everybody feel good about that? Sweet. Are you ready to do hyponatremia in the real world? I kind of think you guys are. Okay. All right. We are a little behind on time. So some quick hitters here for you in terms of hyponatremia. Our goal is six over 24 hours. Okay. This is for true hyponatremia, right? This isn't for someone with a sodium 133. This is for someone with like a legit hyponatremia. So we want to shoot for six over 24 hours. You'll have some attendings that say, hey, eight to 12 is fine. Six over 24 hours. So if you go over and you're at seven, you're probably going to be okay. If you shoot for 10 and you're at 13, 
things could go bad. Every year we have one osmotic demyelination happen at the university. So it won't be you guys now, because we shoot for six over 24 hours. If you all are admitting patients, this patient with a sodium 121 to the floor, it's okay to check frequent labs, right? You can check Q4 labs initially until you see which way their sodium is going. What you don't want is to not check for 12 hours and then you check it again and their sodium is 107 and you didn't know about it, okay? As far as if a patient is seizing because of hyponatremia, the treatment for that is gonna be 3% normal saline. You give 150 cc bolus until they stop seizing. You'll never do this alone, so you shouldn't be doing that, but you should know how you treat these patients, okay? If a patient is seizing because of this, the critical care should be at the bedside and apology should be at the bedside. Cool. And then in terms of um, everything we did today, it's great if the patient hasn't received fluids. If the patient already got fluids, boy, it's a lot tougher to interpret those urine studies. So always try to hold off on fluids until you get the urine studies back. Cool? All right. And then if the sodium is under 120, it should be a hard rule to always send these patients to the ICU. You're not always going to see that, but you all should start to worry about, should I transfer this patient? if the sodium is under 120, cool? And if it's under 120, another good rule of thumb is nephrology should probably be involved in that point. All right. How long are you waiting after those boluses for like resolution procedure? It, it happens pretty quickly actually, yeah. Yeah. I've seen it a couple of times and I don't know that it was the bolus that fixed it, but it lasts a couple of minutes. They also get out of band and other stuff, so. Cool. Um, so quick word on hypernatremia. So when we say dehydration, we mean hypernatremia, but we all say dehydration when we're trying to say hypovolemia. I get it, you're gonna do it, I'm gonna to continue to do it, it's okay, but just understand what the terminology should be. The big thing to take away is when you're in the ICU, you're gonna have patients who can't ask for water or drink water because they're intubated. So it's your job to stay up on their water losses. If their sodium starts to climb, you have to calculate their free water deficit, and then you give them that water back, either through free water flushes in their enteral uh, access or through D5W. The way you calculate that is you can go to empty calc and type it in. But remember, if your patient's putting out four liters of urine and they're hypernatremic and you just replace what their, de what their deficit is, you're still going to be behind. So always keep in mind the urine output, if it's super high, give more free water than you would think. The rate of correction for hypernatremia is 10 to 12. There's no data that shows that there's ever been a case of cerebral edema for from overcorrection in patients with hypernatremia. Regardless, you all, me, everyone feels safer just going 10 to 12. Um, but understand that if it goes a little faster, you're probably gonna be just fine. Cool, we won't talk about that because it's insipidus now, but it's something to think about um, in some of these patients as well. All right, so potassium. We got a patient, 45 year old, ESRD, diabetes. <clears throat> He's coming in with um, shortness of breath, the volume overload on exam, he's missed his HD. The ED calls you, tells you, hey, I got the EKG, it looks okay, but his potassium's nine, there's a trauma alert, can you admit this patient? And then they leave. And they're doing their best, but they're really busy down there. So now you've got to take over. So I'm gonna give you guys 90 seconds to talk with your partner, A, about what you're looking for on that EKG, and B, what you're gonna do for this patient before they die. Cool, thank you. <laughs> All right, all stars, let's circle back just because we're short on time. So, can someone help me out with what we're looking for on that EKG? 
what are we thinking about? When we, when we grab that EKG, they're like, hey, doctor, this is you. Like, what do we do here? What are we looking for on that bad boy? Peak teeth. Peak teeth, awesome. Anything else? QRS whitening. QRS whitening, anything else? Perfect. I heard, Kyle, I heard you say that sometimes the first sign of hyperkalemia in an EKG is what? Uh, sudden death. Yeah, so that can happen. <laughs> so you look for these EKG changes because it increases your suspicion that things are about to go bad, but it doesn't mean that a normal um, EKG can't lead to a patient having a disastrous outcome all of a sudden if they're a case high enough, okay? But um, does anyone here go fishing? No. Oh, Benjamin, thank God. All right, I got one. <laughs> so, so Benjamin, if I if I were to reel in um, this patient's EKG as their sodium as their uh, potassium was increasing, if I hooked the T wave and I started to reel, the T wave would get higher, and as I kept reeling, the intervals would get wider, and as I kept reeling, it would become sinusoidal, and that's it, right? So that's it. Those are the changes that you see with hyperkalemia. Okay, why does it matter? Um, on paper, you're supposed to give a certain medication if you see EKG changes. I'll tell you in real life, and I'll pull our, our uh, other chiefs here. There's a number that you decide that you're just going to give calcium regardless because you're nervous. Do you have a number for that, Jason, if the EKG looks fine? Or do you always wait for EKG changes to give calcium? Uh, I would probably, I mean, if it's above six and there wasn't a contraindication to it, or nothing that gave me pause, I'll drink that prior to school. So six, so what's, what's your number? Seven and a half. Seven and a half. Oh, all right. Great, Dr. Duarte. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Too so, loud, too loud. yeah. So, so I think um, the takeaway is calcium is your friend and you don't necessarily need an EKG change to give it, except you don't want to give calcium constantly to ESRD patients because they have elevated phosphates and calcium and phosphate come together and they deposit in their blood vessels. So don't do it willy-nilly. They come in with 5.8, they're about to get dialysis. You, you're probably okay, all right? But somebody brand new potassium of 8.5, oh man, okay? You, you really have to convince yourself not to do it. Cool. So calcium is where we're going to get the stabilized cardiac membrane. What other medications were you all thinking about for, for this patient? Bicarb. Bicarb? Yes. How do you want to give it? Uh, one amp. One amp? Okay. I had someone uh, last week say uh, oral. It's like, can you imagine tongues? Just like. <laughs> um, good. Um, so, so in this patient, our one concern um, is that they're volume overloaded, right? And so sodium bicarb comes with quite a bit of sodium. And so we wanna be mindful. It doesn't mean that you can't give an amp and like kind of see where things are going, but more, there's there's something that you can use to kind of shift things right now. What, what else would we think about there? Insulin, glucose. Insulin, glucose, but you guys teamed up together, got the right answer. Um, how much would you give? 10 units. 10 units of, regular. of regular insulin? Cool, IV, sub-Q, intranasal. IV. IV, perfect. So every year, an intern will order sub-Q insulin, but it's IV, regular insulin, 10 units, perfect. Um, when you do that, you also give it with dextrose. As you all can imagine, most of the patients that you're dealing with these issues have renal disease, and their ability to clear insulin is uh, diminished. And so their insulin hangs around way longer than their dextrose. And so sometimes in an ESRD, or what I'll do is I'll give five units of IV regular insulin instead of 10 units. You should still get enough of a shift, but it decreases your risk of them becoming hypoglycemic later on. Cool? All right, so that's about, you can give bicarb, be careful of the volume overloaded. You do um, insulin and dextrose, anything else to shift? He pointed at oh, you, I don't know. Oh, sorry, um, inhaled beta. Like Albuterol? Nice, yeah. So it's not just a standard little duo net. This is like continuous, long, uh, strong amounts of albuterol. I practically, like in real life, don't really do it very often. I, I don't know if, if you do. It's just kind of a pain. And so you, you try to get away with the other shifting agents. Cool. And then we've got to get rid of the potassium somehow. Any thoughts on that? KXLA. KXLA. Any other thoughts? Dialysis. Dialysis. Perfect. Love it. Just go to dialysis. <laughs> um, Cool, yeah. So you're saying let's strap it in the stool. 
right? So KXLate, the data on KXLate isn't great, so we're using something called Paterimer now, kind of similar concept. It's an exchange resin in the stool, captures the, the potassium, you get 10 grams of, uh, of locale at a time. Cool. You can give it uh, up to three times a day. Um, anyone want to give Lasix? No, okay. It's an anti-Lasix <laughs> group and that's okay. Um, if he doesn't make urine, it's probably not going to be very beneficial. If they do make urine, you want to give fluids too because you don't want to volume deplete them by making them pee too much. Cool. But if the kidneys work, why not use the laces? Sweet. All right. So this is the EKG. We've, we've kind of figured out everything we're going to do here. Are we worried or not about this EKG? Yes. Yes. Can the back table, anyone tell me why you're worried? I would not sit on those feet. Nice. That's a good way to remember. <laughs> Yeah, so um, for three years I asked about the peak tees and everyone's like, you'll know it when you see it. And that's a good way of remembering it. If it hurts to sit on, then don't. The other, the other uh, one that I heard that I really like is um, basically if the T wave amplitude is greater than the QRS in most of the precordial leads, that's, those are peak T waves. And so you see that here pretty well. Cool. All right, this is it later. Is that worse or better? <laughs> Oh, okay. Wait, we're not sure. Worse. Worse. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so that's worse. Um, but luckily, you treated this patient. They did better because you did all these things. Um, obviously, you're trying to get renal to spin this patient as, as soon as possible, but you're doing all these things in the meanwhile. Sweet. Really quick, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the, on the differential for hyperkalemia. I do want to point out that you don't often see hyperkalemia in ESRD until the GFR is in the 15. Okay, so if someone's GFR is 34, it, you're kind of hard pressed being like, oh, it's just their CKD. Um, the other thing is, if medications are on that could cause hyperkalemia, you always want to stop those. So, ACEs, ARBs, Spiro. And then the last thing I want to mention on this is in your patients who, um, your older males who come in with hyperkalemia out of nowhere, out of proportion to an AKI, you have to rule out urinary retention. Urinary retention can cause hyperkalemia. And so in those patients, you always want to get a bladder scan quick and early. And if they have, um, if they are retaining, you want to go ahead and place a Foley or strict cat them as soon as possible. Cool. So you guys have been doing this plenty at this point, I'm sure. You always want to replace potassium orally if possible. If you have to give it IV because they're in shock, you don't have enteral access, whatever it is. You can give 10 milliequivalents an hour through a peripheral, and you can do 20 milliequivalents an hour through a central line. Okay. The rule of thumb is for every 10 milliequivalents, you increase by 0.1. That rule falls apart when potassium gets lower. So if you're like at 2.5, don't use that rule of thumb. Give more than what you would think you would have to for that rule of thumb. Okay. Kind of talked about this. The last thing I want to mention is um, if their mag isn't replaced and you're struggling to replace a potassium, that's why you're struggling to replace a potassium. Hypomagnesemia keeps open the channel that allows potassium to keep getting peed out. So you have to make sure the mag is doing okay. Cool. Really quickly on this to get you out in time. I want to spend a little bit of time um, talking about poorly controlled diabetes. You all will have dedicated lectures on DK and HHS later on in the year. What I want to spend some time on is um, inpatient uh, management of hyperglycemia. So what you, what you all will see or have seen so far is that oftentimes a newly diagnosed patient with diabetes, right? They came in for something else. Now they have an A1C of 11. Their sugars are in the 300s to 400s. Your team says, let's start them on insulin. And a lot of times what we'll do is we'll put them on sliding scale. Have you all heard that term? And that means it's just short acting insulin. And we're going to see how much they have. And then we'll figure it out later what they need. There's, there's a study done called the RABBIT2 trial. It basically took non-critically ill patients who are hyperglycemic. And they went ahead and they split them up into getting basal bolus versus just lighting versus just lighting scale. The time to improvement of their hyperglycemia was much better than basal bolus, and there was no difference in hypoglycemia. So you should get basal on early. It's not something we do well, but it is something that the data would support you doing. If this is a good trial to talk about on round and kind of wonder why we just put people on sliding scale all the time. Cool. I know Dr. John feels strongly about this and we're going to talk about it. it we'll, we'll give him a, an avenue to talk about this trial, but um, is this not one of the things we do for no reason? What? This trial? This yeah, uh, this whole speech here in the yeah. uh, time scale only is, uh, I think we do for no reason. Yep, yep. 
Um, and then the last thing I want to mention is what our goal for uh, blood glucose control is. It's going to be 180 in hospital. Do we know why that is? Anybody have any idea? Where should for a blood glucose of 180? Sugar trial. Nice, the nice sugar trial. <laughs> so it showed a mortality benefit in patients who our goal was 140 to 180 versus a more restrictive blood glucose goal of like 101 to 140. Um, and so the fact that there was a mortality benefit here really drives this. This was done in an ICU setting, not on wards patients, but we extrapolated. So the last thing before you guys get out of here, you got a patient with who weighs 70 kilos, they're hyperglycemic, you're asked to start this patient on insulin. Can you take 30 seconds and just tell me how you're gonna dose this patient's insulin? Cool, I'm getting some head nods. You guys are rapid at math. Um, so I wrote there 0.2 units per their weight. You'll hear 0 0.3 to 0 0.5, 0 0.3 to 0 0.6. Early in the year, while we're getting our feet wet, while we're understanding things, 0.2 is okay. Then you can kind of, as you gain more experience, you can understand when you'd use a little bit higher in that range. But using this example, can someone tell me how they dose this patient? So total daily dose is 14 units. Perfect. You're gonna get seven of the long acting and then maybe two to three to each meal. Perfect. You got it. So at each hospital, we have certain sliding scales in addition to um, our basal dose, and things will be a little bit different at each hospital. But this concept is what you guys should take away from this, which is should have a basal dose and then meal time on top of that. Cool. Any questions? I know we ran through the last part of that super fast, but now you're sodium expert, so it's worth it. Cool. <laughs> All right, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Congratulations. Thanks, Matt. Um, so I think it's on my next test. Oh, right, yeah. Like, how long did you just do this one? Yeah, I guess. Can I take a food?